all joined from. So appreciate you joining at various different times of the day, whether it's too early for you or too late. Um, today, we have three amazing topics. The first topic we have is resource reports from Marius and Dominic at ING. The second topic is an overview of the months in front end from Tamika at Lyft. And the third one is the uh, Intuit's journey with data discovery uh, with Suresh and his team. So without further ado, we can get started. Uh, first topic, resource reports from Marius and Dominic. Sure, thanks. Uh, so hello, everyone. My name is uh, Marius Gruski, and I work in, work in ING WBAA. We are using Elon Center for yeah, a greater part of uh, uh, a year along with Apache Atlas. And today's presentation is actually on the resource reports, the fun functionality which we proposed and uh, um, actually has been, have successfully um, introduced in our Ramons and installation. Uh, so I give just a very brief uh, introduction to the topic and then Dominic will take over for the gory details of implementation. Uh, so the agenda will be very simple. I will explain what uh, are resource reports, uh, what are those and why do we need them. Uh, and then Dominic will tell you about steps we had to make to make this uh, functionality happen. Mm, show a little demo and summary of, of our uh, work in this subject. Uh, so to start, what are resource reports? Actually, it's a very generic uh, term, which uh, came from the idea that we needed a functionality that would allow us to link a table, in our case, table entities, table entries in Amundsen, uh, to any report that might describe it. And uh, uh, the report in Amundsen is actually an URL pointing to that um, object. So it should point either to a file or a destination that is rendered inside the, that can be rendered in, inside the web browser. And you can start thinking of it in terms of like HTML file or set of files, PDF files, but just as easily it could be a Google uh, doc or Office 365 doc or Confluence page. In our case, these are mostly HTML files, which will become apparent in a second. Uh, and the like basic chart would be that any given table uh, so can link to multiple reports. So you can have multiple different reports looking at the data from a different angle and they would all describe the same table. And this chart basically says that we have a table that has three reports linked to it. One is from the data quality subject the second one is a data profile on the table, and the third one would be a data stability uh, summary. And to translate it into somehow more meaningful technologies, which we actually use uh, in our stack, I let myself uh, switch the, uh, the icons. And then for the data quality, we use great expectations. For data profiling, there is a pandas profiling library, which is very cool and helpful for data scientists and engineers to uh, get acquired, accustomed with the data. And there is also a Popman library, which uh, INGWB actually open source, which is a thing we use for data stability, for measuring data stability. And those three technologies have two things in common, actually. One is they all are related to a data, so we can run those libraries on a table. And the second one is that all output of all those three uh, libraries and is an HTML file or set of files. And now Dominic will basically tell you uh, how we implemented it and uh, how does it look like in Amundsen. Sorry. Okay. So, yeah. So uh, short intro maybe first. So my name is Dominic Homa. I I'm working for uh, wholesale banking advanced analytics team in ING, and uh, I am uh, with Marius part of data asset squads, squad. So uh, let me briefly tell what we had to do to, to make uh, these resource reports work. So uh, some of, some of the, these 
below steps are uh, generic. Uh, some of them are proxy specific and some of them uh, are organization specific. Uh, so let, let's start from, from the top. Uh, so at first we have to extend Amundsen common uh, library uh, table model with this resource reports definition. Uh, next, we have to add some uh, UI button in Amundsen frontend. Uh, then um, at proxy level, we have to, to add uh, this report, uh, entity report uh, definition, and we have to adjust Amundsen metadata library, Amundsen metadata proxy to, to handle these uh, resource reports. And then on uh, organization level, we, we have to implement some uh, custom resource reports client. I, I will talk about it later. We have also hide some sensitive information uh, on the reports and uh, extend our generic ingestion process to, to create and populate uh, these reports. <clears throat> So, uh, so for now, we are using very simple uh, resource reports uh, model. Uh, it's a simple class that consists of two attributes. First of uh, them is a name, it's a report name. And second is URL. It's a URL that points to this, uh, that point to this, to this report. So we just uh, we simply added this class to Amundsen Common Table Model as a first step, um, and this is, these are definitions or um, or our Atlas uh, reports definition on and uh, relationship definition. So on the on the left side there is a uh, Atlas uh, report definition. We have Atlas report entity with two attributes, name and URL. And on the right side, we have a definition of uh, a relationship. So on the one hand, we have a report entity. And on the other hand, we have uh, Atlas object. So so uh, what does it mean? That means uh, Resource reports, by definition, are uh, can be connected, can be re referenced with every Atlas uh, reference object, not only the uh, Atlas table or Hive table. Uh, and this is uh, how it looks like in Atlas UI. This is an example of a uh, uh, Hive table with uh, connected reports uh, we have three reports, one with expectation, one pop one, and one pandas profiling. Mm. And this is how it looks like from the UI, UI perspective. When you, uh, when you go into Amundsen uh, table detail view, uh, if the table which we, which we are looking for is uh, have an active relationship with, uh, with at least one resource report, then the reports button show, shows up. The, the reports button provides sample drop-down list with a uh, list of uh, connected reports. When you click on the report name, uh, the new table, uh, the new browser tab is open and the uh, report URL is activated in that in that tab, but uh, some sometimes providing simple uh, URL is not enough. For example, uh, in ING, our uh, S3 provider does not allow uh, allows to expose any data via browser, so we cannot expose any data via. Uh, HTTP or HTTPS protocol. So, so we, we had to uh, implement our own uh, custom uh, reports client that uh, takes this URL, read the data, receive the data uh, from S3 via Boto Free library, and then expose expose the data to the browser. 
So on the left side, there is a part of uh, uh, Atlas Proxy metadata config class, uh, which allows us to provide reference to resource report client. And on the on the right side, it's it's a it's a part of implementation Atlas Proxy uh, mm -hmm. that uh, make use of this uh, uh, custom reports client. Or if it's none is provided, then simply uh, return uh, our URL and resource report object. Uh, the next part uh, which we have to do is, uh, ext is a, uh, was extended, extending our um, uh, generic ingestion process. As, as you can see, uh, our ingestion process is based on uh, Apache Airflow, and this is a part of our ingestion DAG. So uh, right after the data is ingested in our, in, into Hive table, we uh, we added two more steps, two more uh, Airflow tasks. First, first of them is responsible to generate uh, uh, resource report and store store it uh, on S3, and the second task is uh, is responsible for populate the metadata uh, into Atlas and uh, reference this uh, reference this uh, report with with table, uh, with table. So we also prepared uh, some uh, bulletproof video demo. So so let's start with that. <clears throat> okay. So uh, as you can see, as you can see, we have uh, some table with uh, with re reports connected to. to Two. So we have two reports. One, one report is an advanced data profile, and one is a data quality. So let's go with this advanced data profile. <coughs> so uh, as you can as you can see, this is uh, advanced data profile based on pandas profiling report. So uh, pandas profiling uh, divide variables into um, categorical data and and uh, and numeric data. So um, for categorical data, due to uh, many security reasons, we have to wipe out any uh, any example data, any common values labels. Uh, we have only these only main metrics, but it's it's much better for the numeric data. So, so, so for the numeric data, we have a branch of statistics. We have the quantile statistics and descriptive statistics. We have some some histograms. Uh, we have some uh, some common values. Uh, we have also some extreme values, so mean and max. Uh, the other thing uh, which we have is uh, sample mock data. Uh, we have, uh, Sorry, you have two more minutes. Okay, so I, I, will, I will stretch. So this is a sample data which uh, follows the format of underlying data sets. Uh, okay, so the, the next report is uh, will be data quality uh, reports that is based on uh, based on uh, great expectations where user can define some expectations. Uh, and every ingestion process, we can fire up these expectations and check if they are all met. The expectations can be defined or table level or all column level. It might be very simple ones like null, not null, or very complicated like some, uh, uh, we, can, we can add some advanced uh, models. So uh, that's all for the demo. And to the summary, uh, I can tell that thanks to this resource report, we can easily integrate Amundsen with tools that generate static data reports. And we can provide users with additional external information about data site, like data profile, data quality, or data stability. And all of that is provided via Amundsen. So 
I think that that's all for the presentations. If Mario, you want to add something or uh, there are some questions. Yes, just one minor thing which we missed uh, for the presentation. You also saw a custom uh, Amundsen endpoint. So the demo showed that uh, there is a reports endpoint and it's actually a custom uh, one which we have um, deployed only internally. And it basically renders a, an a index HTML from the using the Boto Free Library. So we had to uh, embed somewhere in the Amundsen and the credentials for, for S3 and then render the um, file in the browser. So this was the um, custom to ING part, uh, achievable for the custom results uh, report client, which basically rewrites S3 URL to Amundsen URL. So that's that's what wasn't on the presentation like thing we had to do. Cool. Thank you. Uh, we have one question. How did you think about uh, embedding some content of the report on the Amundsen page versus simply linking to it? Mm, so I guess that uh, the reports that has been shown are pretty complex ones, and uh, just embedding it in the in the UI could have been tricky because there are like I think at least twenty or thirty only descriptive statistics per column, so it would be difficult to achieve uh, through the UI. Uh, and it was just simpler to 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 use the external uh, reports and show them in the browser. Got it. Did you consider embedding, say, for example, statistics in the column description as a programmatic description or something like that? Uh, so used uh, so far, bef before the uh, resource reports era, we been using the AWS DQ li library to provide the uh, column statistics for the data. Mm, but uh, at some point we uh, reached the uh, moment where it was not enough and uh, we looked at the pandas profiling. We have actually like a, a library um, core developer in WBLA and uh, we reached the decision to, to embed those reports the way we did. And uh, I, I guess that the things that could not be achieved through the um, column statistics, uh, one of those would be the visual thing, things. So for example, histograms on data um, was one thing that couldn't be achieved. There are also correlation diagrams um, in the reports and stuff like that. So it couldn't be all embedded directly into Amundsen's UI. Thank you. Any other questions for Dominic and Marius? All right, thank you both. If you have questions, please reach out to them on Slack. Uh, next up is Tamika. She's going to give an overview of a month in front end. All right. Great. I'll assume everyone can uh, see my screen. If not, uh, make a noise. Um, so in what I'm going to do today is uh, I'm giving a shortened version of an overview uh, that I actually gave uh, at Lyft, uh, given that we had uh, some new engineers join our team this year. Uh, I pretty much want to do a brief discussion of the applica application structure, um, but the most important thing that I uh, think we would want to focus on as a community are the challenges. Um, now that we're actively um, trying to grow, I wanted to share some context, uh, just some more context um, on exactly how things are working and what challenges we face, um, such that we can, you know, start to really leverage whatever knowledge exists in our community or um, people's desire to perhaps like learn more about a particular technology to try to make some progress here. Um, so 
really quickly on the structure side, um, our repository would be considered uh, like a hybrid application because you can see that it has front end code um, in React and Redux as well as a uh, Flask uh, back end server. Um, so the React and Redux application is making requests uh, to the Flask back end server, and it's that Flask layer that talks to the rest of um, Amundsen's services. Um, so like all of the uh, data being passed around is all happening uh, in Python. Um, and there's just some helpful links here about the technologies if you've never worked with them, um, as well as a quick mention of exactly how the uh, React Redux application is connected to Flask. And they also have um, some good Google articles about this kind of pattern. Um, in terms of, this is a, I think I, I'm also going to skip over this one as well due to length. Um, the original version of this took almost uh, 45 minutes and I have 15. Um, so this just gives an overview of the, um, I guess, some more repositories pointing to um, some specific patterns that we use in Redux, if you want to learn more about them, as well as some other main libraries that we're using. Redux Saga for managing um, asynchronicity uh, in those uh, requests that we're making to the Flask backend server, um, as well as uh, Axios for API calls on the front end side. Um, and it's also written in TypeScript, which is typed JavaScript. And once again, these uh, libraries and technologies have um, a lot of good documentation um, out there on the internet. Um, we also have our customization for the front end application. Um, we have the uh, app config, which is ideally uh, a configuration for different UI related options. Um, I say ideally because uh, currently our configurations are not always strictly UI focused. Um, some of them do allow for some business logic to be written into there. Um, and then uh, for unit testing, we use uh, Jest. Uh, Enzyme is a library that helps with additional utilities for testing React components specifically. Um, and for our Redux layer, there's this library that we currently use called Redux uh, Saga Test Plan. Uh, in terms of Flask, uh, we'll skip over this really here as well. Um, we use Flask Blueprints uh, currently, uh, even though there is a task to uh, refactor our uh, entire API layer full endpoints. If anyone's interested, um, we the, in Flask we also establish classes for those custom clients that we have to be able to you know give guidance on on how to uh, write these clients and what's actually necessary like our superset client uh, and Flask currently also handles our logging. Um, you'll notice these action logging decorators over a particular method uh, and for methods that have the action logging decorator, it will uh, fire a log event. Uh, customizations are uh, for Flask are in the uh, Flask configuration and config.py. Once ideally, uh, configurations for the clients, authentications, and other backend uh, powered features. But right now, there is also a little bit of overlap between what could be considered like presentational and what could be considered uh, business logic. Um, for unit testing, just some basic uh, Python unit testing. I pointed to some examples here. Um, and now let's move on to the challenges. Um, general challenge uh, that we've had uh, since building this application is, you know, how to best structure the application as the need uh, as the needs change and as the code base grows. It's it's essentially growing pains, right? Um, it's something that's expected, something that uh, I think in a uh, real world scenario takes time to actually figure out um, as the tool itself becomes more mature. Um, but right now, what we try to do is follow best practices, keeping up as our framework evolves and as edge knowledge increases. Um, we've had a lower bandwidth uh, for major improvements at Lyft, given the size of the team. So sometimes what that results in is inconsistent code. If, let's say, we were using one particular pattern when we first started in 2018, a year later, we figure out there's a better way to write something, and we don't always have the bandwidth to just retroactively uh, go back and refactor everything. Uh, that makes learning a little bit more difficult for newcomers if they're uh, not seeing consistent code examples. Um, so once again, current solutions, we're trying to document best practices, follow best practices, uh, engage you all to try to assist with uh, refactors and other work. Uh, we'll be speaking uh, or mentioning um, some of those items at the end of this, um, as well as a best effort to trend towards improvements. 
Um, what that means is if we know that there's a better way of, of doing something, it's not necessarily about, um, you know, refactoring everything at once, um, but more so let's get some examples in it and turn towards um, those new patterns. Uh, for application state management, the Redux layer, um, the biggest challenge there is, is figuring out what's the best way to set up and organize our application state. Um, and Redux is uh, notorious for having a lot of boilerplate. Um, the effects is, uh, of this is that um, some of uh, feature enhancements or even small bug fixes sometimes that we've had has ended up uh, requiring a lot of code changes sometimes in this area. Uh, there was one once upon a time where we were just having too many uh, bugs and edge cases pop up with some of our search logic um, that required us to do a little bit of restructuring of the Redux layer in the search area twice. Um, once uh, Daniel had tackled it and the second time I had tackled it. Um, and so some of the solutions here, once again, trying to follow best practices, but then also trying to not accumulate too much tech debt in this area. Um, uh, from personal experience that time that we had to go in and do um, some major refactors and restructuring here, I think it was uh, the source of that was just uh, perhaps spending a little bit too long um, not uh, really taking a step back to figure out if we were going down the right path in the way that we were structuring all of uh, this asynchronous logic. Um, some planned work here that will be called out is uh, using selectors to comp compute derived data. More context is going to be in this link about what that means for Redux. Once again, they have really good documentation. Um, for unit testing, uh, we struggle sometimes uh, with the fact that like different frameworks have different approaches. And so if, if you've worked in front end before, you might not necessarily have worked with like these particular li libraries. So there's just a little bit of ramp up there. We currently don't have end to end tests. Um, and there's a small concept of, of scaling when it comes to the fact that uh, in my previous job, um, our unit test framework was uh, really thorough, uh, but given the age and the size of that code, it got to the point where our unit tests had taken for uh, all of our uh, front end code had taken about 20 minutes to run. Um, and I hope we never get to that point in <laughs> Munson. Um, we have some more solutions here uh, that we'll be pointing out. We have uh, some tickets related to improving unit tests, or if we don't, uh, I plan on filing them. Uh, for user experience, another thing that we struggle with is our attention when it comes to error states. Uh, there's parts of our UI where we did not uh, cover all of the edge cases, specifically error states, where, where if something goes wrong, it's not as, uh, it, it's not a good experience uh, to the user because uh, there's uh, some flows and, and some components where we're not accurately um, showing helpful information on the error state or on the empty state. Um, also for the user experience, we've been thinking a lot at Lyft about if we're logging the right things, um, how we're logging things, are we logging things the right way? So with our new features, um, we're trying to make sure that we are you know, logging every uh, user interaction um, to just fill that gap first. Um, and then another thing specifically for open sources, uh, we are definitely aware that we don't have any good documentation on like what we log and, and and how we log it. And if you wanted to query these events that were being sent, what would you actually look for? Um, so the solutions here is once again, trending towards improvements. We're prioritizing handling error states uh, and empty states for all of our future features. Uh, we have to resolve this error state uh, tech debt and we do uh, want to have a dedicated effort to improve uh, our logging support. A uh, couple more slides here. When it comes to our customizations, I'm pretty sure this is something that the community is definitely familiar with, this concept of how do I make this thing work the way that I want it to work. And we have a lot of way to configure things on the front end. We have the app config, the Flask config. We have Python entry points for some custom clients. Uh, so we have a lot of options and documentation is, is not as strong as it should be here as well. Uh, and so our solutions here, uh, we first have to focus on our documentation, trying to get out some how-tos um, on the site. And then uh, at some point having an intentional process for improving our customization op options by you know, taking a step back, looking at everything we have, figuring out what we need to improve, deprecate, restructure, move somewhere else, et cetera. 
uh, miscellaneous um, issues here. I won't go through uh, each one, but if you have more questions on any of these concepts, um, if I called out a challenge that you might be, or someone you know might be familiar with um, in previous work uh, that they've done, uh, let's definitely get uh, some chat started about it on front end. And lastly, what I would like to uh, call out is um, we have started a particular uh, front end code base cleanup project on Amundsen, uh, the umbrella repo. So we have these to do tickets here. These are tickets that we've uh, already evaluated, accepted, should have uh, some good guidance on how to move forward, or at least uh, pointing to some good examples. And uh, all of these tickets are currently related to some of those um, like code base uh, cleanup or best practices challenges that we faced. Also want to uh, call out some specific features. Um, we have a ticket for this like add and expand uh, feature. Uh, recently, as in uh, beginning of this week, uh, we merged in a change that improves uh, the UI for uh, nested column types. Um, so essentially what it is is when you click on a column type, it used to just all show up in a, in a popover in a tooltip, and it was very unreadable, especially if it was uh, really big or really long. So now we show that in a modal and we've uh, parsed it out. And uh, the next feature that we want is to add uh, some uh, cool expand collapse interactions. So that's what this ticket covers. We also have um, this bug that happened to be filed yesterday where I, I took a quick look at it and uh, laid out some next steps if anyone is interested. Um, and then also another ticket here that would be related to the performance of our application. In the front end channel, um, we'll be posting, we'll probably uh, put this in the description of the channel as well as uh, have a running poster pin somewhere of maybe like our top help wanted issues. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to leave a little bit of time for questions and discussion. All right, cool. Um, Mark, um, how sorry, go ahead. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, I, thank you for presenting this. I think it's really good for the community to see all these things and uh, where they can contribute. Are there any particular issues out of the ones you pointed out that are newbie friendly? So if there's someone who's trying to get involved in the Amundsen community, uh, which ones of those should they get started on? Uh, let's see. Uh, newbie friendly is a little bit difficult for me to answer because I think it depends on what technologies they might be familiar with or not familiar with. Um, so if someone's already been exposed to React, um, something like this could be newbie friendly. But if they haven't, then it's You're not. You're not sharing your screen anymore to me. Oh, sorry. Um, thanks. Uh, so yeah, so as I was saying, something like this ticket, which is uh, uh, this uh, pure like updating this component, if someone has any experience with React, this would be newbie friendly for them. But if someone is not experienced with React or, or you know, at least, you know, taking a tutorial or something, then it might not be. So I think what could help answer that question, um, let's see, I, I will try to take a look and, and give a better opinion versus something that's wishy-washy. But I think uh, if there are newbies who are interested, if you could share with us any context of, if there are things that you're familiar with in front end, then it would be, then it would help us say, oh, well, maybe you could take a look at this. Maybe you could take a look at that. If you're not familiar with anything, um, then we could also try our best there as well. Because as I mentioned, some of these, uh, a lot of these frameworks are really well documented. Um, so to that, I'd say for anyone who's interested, let's have a chat in the front end uh, channel. Cool. I, I would Thank add you. also that, um, yeah, using the good first issue label, this is kind of a good proxy, I think. Um, but again, it depends a lot on the context. Um, any other questions for Tamika and others? Uh, Verdan has a question. He's like, I believe there was a discussion about the UI for Lineage in the past over Slack and also in community meetings. Do we have an update on that? Uh, not an update in terms of the fact that it's it's on our radar and we do have to start with the design for that. Um, 
I can't see if, if Daniel is on this call or not, but Daniel, if you have any updates on that from your end, then uh, chime in. Yeah, uh, we're still doing user research and figuring out exactly what features we wanna put in, but it's on our, uh, on our roadmap. That's an act active item that we wanna work on. Sorry if that's just like a non-answer, but yeah. Yeah, we essentially have to figure out exactly what we want to build first or what we should be building first. Yeah, Yeah. so it's a, uh, we whether we target like table lineage first or including column lineage. So that's also some study needs to be done, I guess. But the targeting will be like early Q4, we start started some initial work, I would say. From a front end perspective, should it matter like the level of lineage uh, on what kind of, I guess, lineage graph you'll build? Uh, I think so, because depending okay. on what we're building, it would, you know, what interactions do people want to be able to do, right? And we can make assumptions, but uh, mm -hmm. we need to do the user research uh, yeah. so that we can know for sure. Okay. Cool. Um, thank you, Tamika, for presenting that. Thank you, others from Lyft Front End Community sharing. Uh, if you have any other questions, hang out at the hashtag Front End channel. All right. Uh, the next one is into its journey on data discovery. Uh, before we get started on this, I wanted to share, this is something new we are doing in the community. In the community meetings, usually we present stuff where companies and organizations and communities are using Amundsen. In this case, that's not the case. And part of what we want to do in this in a Munson community is learn from adjacent communities. So this is an example of an adjacent community at Intuit sharing their experience with data discovery. We have interacted with many people like Gary and Suresh in the past, and this is an opportunity for them to come and share with us in a little more detail what they're doing. Off Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. You stole my first line, so I appreciate it. Uh, let me see how I can present my screen, sorry. Uh, oh no, I think we lost Suresh for a moment. Uh oh. Hope he joins soon. Maybe well, he's rejoining. I could attempt to, and then if I drop off, he, he'll be back, right? Haha. <laughs> hey, sorry about that. My bad. Can you guys see my uh, screen? Yep. All right. Um, so thank you, Mark, and thank you, the Amundsen community. So this will not be a very uh, technical presentation. We just want to share our journey, our vision. And uh, since the previous one ended on a user research note, uh, talk a little bit about the user research we have been doing over the last four months. Um, so um, our, I think there's Fresh, some- you able to put it in presentation mode? It's a little small. Yeah. I'm not sure if that will mess up the sharing. We'll see. Can you guys still see my screen? It's better, yeah. So um, this is the outcome of our user research that we've been doing. And there are some additional screens, and there's a lot more detail. Uh, this doesn't show that. But essentially, um, at least from a vision perspective, it lays out at a high level what we're thinking about, uh, meaning um, our version of the catalog. And I will talk about that a little bit is pretty much a comprehensive uh, registry of all data and data-related assets, uh, whether it's data objects, whether it's data processes that created, uh, that created data or processors uh, that were involved in that. Um, and in this includes models, dashboards, and so on. Um, and then there is another element of the level of data quality from raw to uh, you know, raw in the transactional systems to raw in the lake to curated. So some kind of a hierarchy 
in terms of how data is, how much data is ready for querying or for reporting purposes. Um, with that said, um, a little bit about what we think, how we're thinking about the maturity model for the data catalog. Can you guys see my screen? Are you guys with me? Yep. OK. Yeah, I got it. Yeah. So um, this is a level, different levels. And I should thank Gary for this. This is his, uh, this is his vision. This is how he's been talking about, uh, has been thinking about it. Um, you know, you have a base level, which is purely around data sets and documentation, think Excel. And then you have more processors and lineage that you add on to it. And now you start getting a bit more of some of the graphy content. And then level three is you're going beyond relational to thinking about topics, uh, models, features. And I think this is where we are today. We have an implementation of a catalog that's sitting on Atlas, which we call the metadata registry. Um, and it's got integrations with, I think, 15 or 16 different applications, whether it's our Kafka, managed Kafka in infrastructure, or our curation infrastructure, or our ML platform. Um, so it's got these different connections. Um, and then level four and level five keeps going, pushing the pushing the envelope. Um, and you talk, we see things like hierarchy and glossary, and this is more addressing uh, the quality of the data itself in terms of how much we are able to curate it and how much documentation is there and how much this is query friendly. Um, so not only you can query it from a query editor, but you can actually ask questions uh, from a PM perspective or any non-technical person's perspective. And level five, I think we saw a presentation earlier where this is integrated with some quality monitoring system and you're actively updating uh, or profiling data and updating the catalog with that piece of information. And today, I think we are at between level two and three, level 2.5, where we have uh, support for uh, relational tables. Uh, we have support for uh, topics, uh, processors, um, and uh, the lineage between these three, these different artifacts. Um, and in terms of a problem statement, essentially uh, today we have two. Um, we are transitioning from a vendor supported catalog, which is Alation, to Apache Atlas. So we have those two different catalogs, infrastructures, and we want to migrate to our metadata registry, which is on Atlas. And distributed source of information. So we want to become, we want the catalog to become the single uh, source of truth um, or the system of record for all documentation for data. Um, content, so we have different uh, different definitions of content quality. Uh, so starting with a very simple business title and description to having more uh, rich content around compliance, governance, um, ownership. Um, so that's a key part of our strategy as we go forward in FY21. Um, and as we think about things like the data mesh and uh, a root cause analysis for data incidents, how do we go back down that lineage graph to see where the issue occurred and finding out who the owner is? Um, this is more internal for us, which is our current uh, implementation has stability issues and we want to move away from there. Um, same thing, we want to move towards a open source infrastructure, which is a, based on Atlas or any other open source technology so that you're not limited by uh, their roadmaps or by their licensing. Uh, that's something that we face uh, on a month-to-month -month basis today. So moving on, I'll, I'll hand it over to Pradeep, who is our product manager for the metadata registry. Um, Pradeep. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Suresh. Uh, I guess you'll continue on the slides. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so what? just wanted to call out a uh, little bit of context, right? As uh, Suresh pointed out, we were uh, using some third-party vendors for catalogs. Uh, we found some uh, gaps where uh, those features that we are looking out for were not being met. So we started leveraging Apache Atlas. And the way we went about this process is, uh, instead of trying to, can I, yeah, instead of trying to go about uh, rebuilding those features that some of these or out of the box uh, product catalogs already provide. We wanted to make sure we address primarily those use cases that were not being met. So we started uh, leveraging Atlas primarily for cataloging things like uh, Kafka topics, ML models, features, processors, lineage, and the likes of them. We started primarily with the programmatic use cases uh, to hydrate the content in the data catalog. Uh, it's been a little more than a year now. 
and what we wanted to do is uh, in the next one year or so uh, shift our focus or uh, probably pivot out I would say our pivot our focus from the programmatic use cases to our end user use cases which are more providing a user friendly solution very persona based solutions uh, persona based information uh, be it for a data scientist analyst or engineer primarily uh, but there are also like side personas that we have identified that would be using data catalog so if we can move on to the next slide yeah so uh, in continuation what we are trying to do is instead of trying to tackle it from a central data platform team uh, without any domain understanding uh, what we are trying to do is adopt the data mesh philosophy where uh, wherein we will use a technology based approach uh, to provide the catalog and exploration capabilities while uh, the content which is the user provided content which is owned by the data producers and owners who are the necessarily the domain experts to produce the content uh, from the catalog or stream we will primarily provide capabilities around having improved search uh, ensuring that the data standards are being followed we have done some research around what defines a good metadata uh, just to call out a simple simple example right having description having lineage having uh, governance metadata the classification around it the ownership all of them are primarily are the most common definitions of good metadata uh, similarly we want to have end-to-end -end lineage what we have also come to realize uh, with usage of uh, atlas has been that uh, if customers are using an out-of-the-box exploration tool like any of the open source clients uh, that most of the databases and others provide and they use catalog it is not providing them an end-to-end -end holistic experience. We wanted to have an embedded catalog in the exploration and the embedded exploration in the catalog. So we are working towards that. Uh, in terms of user documentation, uh, we do have user documentation for majority of the data objects and process. Having said that, not all of them can be uh, put into the square hole, uh, sorry, the square hole philosophy, right? We cannot put it into a standard form of title descriptions. So what we want to do is provide a more free, free form documentation mechanism where customers can add architecture diagrams and the likes of that uh, to this data objects in the catalog. Uh, we are providing a lot of obviously the crawlers, uh, which not only crawls the metadata from databases and the likes of them, but also brings in the user content uh, depending on where they have actually generated be it through csv files some of them are stored in wikis and the likes of that uh, similarly we are working on the activity work stream the exploration work stream which will generate the activity data that will feed back into the catalog to provide a more enriching uh, discovery experience uh, lastly the content work stream will primarily be people and process focused where we'll allow customers to discover the owners and the stewards and the stewards are primarily responsible for ensuring that uh, based on the reporting infrastructure we have provided they can identify any gaps in the content and uh, work towards improving the content over there and finally uh, just wanted to call out the fact that all three experiences around catalog and workstream we are providing a new skin which is built on uh, our own in-house intuit design system uh, so that we can provide a singular experience for customers be it for catalog exploration or for other uh, platform applications be it for curation and ingestion and the likes of that through the same tool rather than having them to uh, go to different tools for different uh, use cases so that was a brief overview of how our journey has been till date And I think I wanted to call out, like towards the end, Pradeep mentioned, uh, we went back and forth or are still probably going back and forth on whether we can leverage Amundsen or not. And I think it's this push and pull between uh, how much do we use our own Intuit design system so that everything, like we have a pretty rich ecosystem of internal developer tools uh, that have their own front facing uh, user interfaces. Uh, so how 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 true do we stick to that versus leveraging something like Amundsen, which is also great? And um, so that's the uh, that's the conversation that's happening internally. 
Awesome. Are there more slides or would you like to take questions or discussion now? Pradeep, are we done? Uh, I know we had a tech stack slide. Do you want to show that or? Yeah, we can probably take another 10 seconds to go to the sure. next slide. Yeah. Uh, this is just a subset of yeah, how our true. tech stack looks like. Uh, uh, this kind of boils down to our, how our org has been organized. From the central data platform team, we have a data lake. <clears throat> we provide some limited runtime engines, particularly on the data lake. And we also provided, uh, provide a little bit of uh, uh, exploration tools around uh, notebooks and uh, Alation Compose capability. But anything outside of these three, uh, the ones highlighted in blue, it's uh, purely left to the uh, users and the communities. They have completely complete freedom to use any of the tools available in the market. And it's pretty complex tech stack, and which is where I think uh, we went about using Atlas, which provides a more free form modeling of the objects and the toolings, which also makes our life much more difficult because the content is now distributed across different systems. Thanks, Pradeep. Yep, I think uh, this is a fairly generic tech stack uh, that we're using. Um, and I think over the last three months, we have been doing a lot of user research internally on what the because we realized the Atlas uh, front end uh, leaves is not great. Um, so we were we've been actively doing a lot of research, and this is one of the things that we have been working on. Um, and we don't we don't have necessarily all the screenshots that we can show over here right now. Sure, thank you for sharing. Um, questions or comments for the Intuit team? I'm curious to hear um, ING team's uh, thoughts on this, especially because you folks were using Atlas first and then moved on to using Amundsen. And what was that process like uh, for you? Mm, so I can uh, I can answer that. Although when uh, when I joined ING. We already were using Amundsen, so I wasn't part of the original team, let's say. Uh, so our experiences so far are uh, that there are uh, there are several benefits to using Atlas. Obviously, the the truth in saying that Atlas's UI is not great cannot be under, uh, <laughs> under uh, stated because it's it's true. It's probably one of the reasons why we are using Amundsen with Atlas is that its UI is uh, not great, not the best user experience. A uh, couple of things that popped up in my head during your presentation was something I was we were also thinking on uh, the models. Like, is it uh, machine learning models which we are uh, yeah. storing in? So that's something we are actually looking into um, like getting a first uh, iteration of entities to build a lineage uh, around model uh, model um, machine learning and all the life cycle, life cycle around it. And that was also my idea to probably uh, consider consider this like an entity that can at some point. Uh, but I'm curious, how do you collect this metadata re re around models? Because Atlas actually has several hooks, but uh, these are not currently supporting uh, machine learning, as, as I think. Yeah, yeah. Sai. Sai, our principal engineer from the catalog team is out here. Sai, Sai. can definitely answer this. Uh, Sai, all hey, Maria, uh, what we have done is like we have our uh, custom atlas models for uh, uh, the ml features and then we have uh, the apis to publish those features so okay. the ml team uses our uh, uh, apis to publish those features into atlas so, so you because are, these are so your this is a pro are, so your entity definitions are custom ones not coming from atlas right correct 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 we have our custom entity definitions and, and then like uh, so once we have those custom definitions, people can uh, publish their uh, features. Uh, and underneath, uh, 
this would go into atlas actually using those entities okay i see because in atlas 2.1 i guess there are already out of the box model um, machine learning uh, entities uh, but yes, we are using atlas 2.0 actually so okay thanks cool and we have a central ml platform so it makes it easier to do that integration um, as opposed to reaching out to different teams we're close to the end of the time, so I want to thank Suresh, Pradeep, and the rest of the Intuit team for coming today and sharing. If, if there are full-on questions, they're all part of the Slack channel, so please chat there. Um, I wanted to open the floor to see if there's anything else anyone from the community wanted to bring up today. Um, yeah, um, so hi, my name is Allison. Uh, I'm with Lyft, and I had uh, mentioned on the Slack, if anyone is leveraging uh, the current badges we have, uh, uh, Anna Munson right now, please uh, respond to the message I sent on Slack. This is the link to it um, because we want to make some changes. There's more context in that message as well. And we want to make sure that we have all the use cases uh, from the community before we do that. So please, if you're leveraging badges right now, just respond to that message. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you especially to the presenters for speaking. And uh, we look forward to continuing this conversation on Slack and talking again next month. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.